In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Your Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and this discussion. Lift up to you this hour. Give us hearts open to understanding your will. Give us minds ready to grasp you, tell us, and souls full of your glory. We entrust this time to you as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So John Paul II has been talking about freedom. What true freedom is, what it's not. He's going to trying to address these various um, theories floating around out there that are causing confusion and moral law and what's right and wrong. And John Paul II likes to go and talk about what's good first before he talks about the bad. Currently, we're in the middle of a section on freedom in nature. So what is the relationship of nature or things? What a thing is, the yeah, that's sort of thing that a thing, um, not nature in the sense of the trees and the woods, nature in the sense of the yeah, essence of thing, whatever the thing is. Nature and freedom. And especially man's nature. Human nature. So Article 48. What is to carefully consider the correct relationship between freedom and human nature? In particular, the place of the human body in questions of moral law. What does the human body have to do with morality? If moral choices are of the soul, the will is where we choose right and wrong, what does the flesh have to do with that? A freedom which claims to be absolute is if treating the human body as a raw datum, or devoid of any meaning and moral value, until freedom is shaped, shaped it, in accordance with its design. Consequently, human nature and the body appear as presuppositions or preambles, materially necessary for freedom to make its choice, the external to the person, the subject of the human act. The functions would not be able to constitute reference points for moral decisions. The finalities of these inclinations would merely be physical goods, called by some pre-moral. To refer to them, nor to find in them rational indications with regard to the order of morality, we expose oneself to the accusation of physicalism or biologism. In this way of thinking, the tension between freedom and the nature conceived of in a reductive way is resolved by a division of the man himself. So let's go through some of these terms and break it down. <laughs> John Paul II is referring, uh, among other things, to certain people trying to explain why um, contraception is okay, especially where we've seen this argument brought forward. And what they'll say is any kind of moral law which says that the human marriage is meant to be a certain way and therefore contraception destroys that. They say, well, that relies too much on biology. It's making biology be the determinant of morality. And the problem with that, they say, is that we're more than just our biology. So what they end up doing is they end up splitting and separating the human being into parts. And they say, is you have to ignore your biology, because that's just, that's not, that's pre-moral, that's for the moral choices. You have to focus on instead right and wrong, good and bad, which is a fancy way of saying, I'm going to do what I want. But they, but they try to get rid of the, the by saying, oh, you're just focusing on biology. Because you, you want to say that you know, love is what matters and love is of the heart, it's focusing on the body. After you'll see this. So what John Paul II is saying, he's saying that you're trying to address this and other things like it. Um, he says, what they're saying basically is human nature and the body, this kind of thinking. For these people only become pre-moral. In other words, the background, like the mixing bowl of the cake, not the actual cake. 
you know, the stuff that contains the moral choice is the stuff that's there, but it's before the moral question comes in. So we have, we have a body, we have a soul, human nature, you know, but those things that these people would say have nothing to do with right, wrong, good, or bad. They're just there. What they would say then is that these become about freedom, about morality, only when our will enters in, or our freedom enters in, our choices enter in, and we choose what to do with these stuff. That choice, what to do with that, that becomes good and bad, right and wrong. And that could sound kind of smart and kind of intelligent and kind of complicated, but it had to be basically ways of, ways of getting rid of this fact. And the fact is, is that God created the human body, God created human nature, and God said these things are for particular reasons. When he talks about finalities of these inclinations, the word finality in this sense refers to um, the reason you do something. So, I can exercise, that's what I'm doing, exercise in a vanity and, and pride, exercise because I'm told to be obedience, and exercise because I need to exercise as good for me. But we've all kinds of reasons. The reason I'm doing it and is into it. Um, according to these people, the body and human nature would not be able to have anything to do with right and wrong because the reason you do something isn't based upon the body, it's based upon our ultimate end or human happiness or things like that. So what they end up saying is my reason for doing something is my happiness or what I want. Or, and so the body is relevant. And the problem with, you, with this, John Paul II says, is that you get rid of this, this question by saying this doesn't matter. And all that matters is my freedom, what I want. Again, it goes back to uh, C.S. Lewis's um, measuring stick for, you know, is something, you know, if you say something he says in one syllable words, and, and, if it, and, if, and, if, and if it doesn't make sense in one syllable words, it doesn't make sense in twelve syllable words either. And the problem is a lot of people will, will, will use twelve syllable words to sound really smart and to sound like something is good. And you say, well, go say it in one syllable words and see if it still sounds good. No. So the one syllable word of saying this is, my body doesn't matter, I can do what I want. That's the one syllable version of this issue. John Paul II continues. So now this is John Paul II's critique on this. This moral theory does not correspond to the truth about man and his freedom. It contradicts or just teaches the unity of the human person, whose rational soul is per se the sensualitor, the form of his body. Let me stop right there. <laughs> what word is that? What was that? What word is that? That as. Well, that, that's Latin. That's not English. <laughs> I can't so when you split the human person and say freedom, my soul, my choices, that's what makes me me. You get rid of the essential fact that the body and soul are meant to work together. The body and soul together equal the human person. The body by itself is not a human person. It's a part of a human person. The soul by itself is not a human person. It's part of the human person. Both are necessary. Going back to Greek philosophy, the, the term being used here, it has been used by the church, or matter of form. 
And matter is the stuff that makes things up. And form is what makes a thing be what it is. Um, so for example, wood of this podium, the wood would be the, form, the matter of this podium. The form is the shape and the function and the idea that's kind of poured into the wood, shaping it, making it as opposed to a table or a chair. When it comes to purely material things, it's more of an abstract concept. It's used to explain things like sacraments. So you get verbal baptism, the matter is the water, the form is the words. So the, the words shape the, the water and make it be a system of sacrament. This was then used to try to explain the human person. Where the body is the stuff, the matter, the physical part, and the soul um, enlivens, makes real, and gives life to the body. This Latin phrase is, is simply saying the rational soul, the soul that can think, can reason, can love, can choose. So it makes the body be the human body. It makes the body be alive, living, and it's the essence that makes the, the, the body be human. The spiritual and immortal soul is the principle of unity of the human being. The soul is what the soul united the body makes that be one human person, one human thing. Corporate anima unus. A unity of body and soul as a person. These definitions are only pointed out to the body, which has been promised the resurrection, will also share in glory. But they also remind us that reason and free will are linked with all bodily and sense faculties. Because we're one person, because we're, we're one unit, one thing, both body and soul. What it means that is that in order for our, our soul to function in a human manner, in a proper manner, we begin with our senses, we begin with the body. When we want to do, exercise our freedom, we do so with our body. We want to love or care for someone, we do so you know, by speaking, by acting, by treating them well. We want to learn something, we do so beginning with the senses. And so even though our, our soul, the spiritual part, is the higher function of us, yes, it's true. It always begins with the body. Without the body, our soul cannot function in human manner. Now, miraculously, right now in heaven, the saints don't have bodies. It was God helping them, yes. You know, so St. Teresa of Avila has no body right now. But her soul can know and reason and love through the power and glory of God. So it's, but it's not a human manner. She's not fully human yet because she has a resurrection. Um, she's missing her body. It's not a complete human person at this point. It'll happen the resurrection. But what it's saying is we need both of these things for a human function. So one of, one of the great flaws in this way of thinking is it makes our, our body seem to be like this lead balloon hanging on the soul, hanging on to the soul. It makes, it makes the soul be the human person by itself. And the body just has this hanger on and take or leave. The person, including the body, is completely entrusted to himself. It's in the unity of the body and soul, the person is the subject of his own moral acts. In other words, when I choose to do right or wrong, sin or virtue, everything I do contains both body and soul in this life. Any kind of virtue, I pray, I say mass, I help someone out who's, who's poor, I fill the blank. Can you do that without your body? No. Um, every sin I do, can you do it without the body? No. Because even, even, even th things that are purely in the mind involve my imagination, my brain, my memory, my, you know, all those. So everything we do, virtue or vice, any moral act is contained in the whole of it, not just one part of it. Now, it is true that the center of right and wrong does lie in the will. That's what makes it it's free, the free choice. 
but, but exercise that involves the whole of me. The person, by light of reason and the support of virtue, discovers in the body the anticipatory signs, the expression, the promise, and the gift of self, in conformity to the wise plan of the Creator. It is in the light of the dignity of the human person, the dignity which must be affirmed for its own sake, that reason grasps the moral value of certain goods for which the person is naturally inclined. The human person together has a dignity. It's not just one piece has dignity. The entire human person has dignity. And so whatever we do, whatever we look for, whatever we need, it's about this dignity of the human person. And since the human person cannot be reduced to a freedom, which is self-designing, but entails a particular spiritual bodily structure, the primordial, the first moral requirement of loving and respecting the person as an end, and never as a mere means, also implies by its very nature respect for certain fundamental goods, without which one would call it relativism and arbitrariness. Okay, so to love somebody as an end and not as a means. There are some things we do for their own sake, and some things we only do because it's the best way to get it. So you want to go to Mass, so you let them go to Mass. But you have to drive the car in order to get it. Driving the car is the means, your end, your goal, your reason for doing it, as you get. If you simply love a human being because they make good shoes, or because they make you feel good, or because they're, they're rich and you want to get, get some of that sweet cash. You're loving them as means. We respect them because of who they are and what they are, and love them for their own sake. Leave this tie back to God. That's loving them as an end. What John Paul II is saying is that because of the dignity of human beings, created by God, destined for heaven, loved by God, sin, saved by Christ Christ's love, all these things give man's dignity. Human beings never be treated merely as a means of something else. It is always wrong to say I'm going to want to love human beings or treat human beings simply as a, re a means to get something else. For wealthy, for power, for whatever. Anytime I'm using human beings simply as a means, a vehicle to get me somewhere, rather than I be, I am loving them most. And because of this too then, not only does this become a guideline for my freedom, right? If I'm going to love someone, love someone simply because I like the way they cook, that's only when I'm using them so we can get more food. I'm using my choices that. Not only that, what the second says is that there are other things that tie, so close to tie into this. For instance, that they then have their food, then they have their food free will. Um, making certain that they're fed and clothed, not going to start with that. I can't say I care about you as more than just a, me a means to get me somewhere. But I'm going to let you start on the street, not, not in this little, as long as you're not in my way, I'm going to buy. So there's certain fundamental things that have to do with the human person that they're so invited into this. And those also become then boundaries and guidelines for my proper exercise of my free will. Make sense? So that's what he's talking about, is these little, these little barriers. So it's not simply, so it's not simply have my freedom, whatever I want to do, but that's what matters. Every, every choice I want, that's what matters, because I'm free. It's the human person, and those things that up to the human person, they're necessary to love them truly. And also, of course, to love God. Those are the guidelines, the boundaries to exercise freedom well. Good questions? Okay. 49. A doctrine which associates the moral act and bodily dimensions of its exercise. So if you try to say, my choice is this, how I live out in the body doesn't matter. So my choice is love. That means I'm sleeping with my girlfriend, that doesn't matter because that's just the body. 
Okay. No one would say it that bluntly, very few people, some people would, but, but usually they'll use these big fancy words, that's what they mean. So a, a doctor which says, I, I can separate my moral choices, my, my, what's, what I'm choosing, good or bad, from how I'm actually living out in the real world, that's heresy. <laughs> it's contrary, John II says, to the teaching of scripture and tradition. Thus, doctor revives in new forms certain ancient errors, which have always been opposed to this by the church, because they reduce the human person to a spiritual and purely formal freedom. You know, a freedom that can't, is not lived in real life is a real really freedom. If all my freedom is is thinking nice thoughts, that's not human. That's not a human being. Um, and so, if what I'm doing here doesn't really matter. I'm choosing to be kind. I'm not going to punch him in the nose. Well, that's not a. Re I can't. That, that's not a human being anymore. That's something else. You're trying really hard not to punch him in the nose. <laughs> I was trying. I couldn't help myself. Well, it, it goes back to certain errors. There, were, there was the Gnostics and there were the Manichaeans. Um, I don't know if he's going to mention them or not. But anyway. Um, the Manichaeans, I know that and it's, let's try to the big ones. Um, the Manichaeans, later on the Albigensians, certain kind of Gnostics. What the Manichaeans said was there's two principles in the world of good and bad. And there's one good, one bad. Kind of yin and yang, black and white. Um, what they said is that the immaterial is good, the bodily is bad. And that could be two different outcomes. On the one hand, the people who, who would be very ascetic and, and very um, prayerful and very puritanical, times the point where they would say, I'm going to kill myself, I'll be free from the body. Mm -hmm. You also have the people who would say, okay, the body doesn't matter. I'm going to steal, lie, cheat, sleep around, and it doesn't matter because the body doesn't matter. That's just my lower day for pulling me down. It's nothing to do with me. Because me, that's my soul, and my soul is, within, is a praying of God, thinking of the good things, but this dark material body, that's a transfer. So I'm, I'm a good person. But I only just do bad things. <laughs> my body does bad I do good things. My body does bad things. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> no. And if my body happens to punch, you know, Bob's body in the nose, well, that's okay because Bob's body is also bad and broken. So the fact that I treat that body badly doesn't matter because the physical is evil. So we both kind of work side by side. We had this, this very puritanical and sometimes even suicide attacks. And you also have this very, very fleshly and physical and hedonistic because it doesn't matter. And that's really where this thought goes to. This reduction misunderstands the moral meaning of the body and the kinds of behavior involving it. But the fact that God became man, that God gives us food and sacraments that are physical, the Eucharist itself is physical, they prove the body is good and the body is meant for heaven as well. You, you can't believe these things in the Catholic. You're denying all kinds of things. You're attacking all kinds of things. The incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the Eucharist, the sacraments. And you hold these things. St. Paul declares that the immoral, the idolaters, the adulterers, sexual perverts, homosexuals, what that means, um, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, robbers, are excluded from the kingdom of God. This condemnation, repeated by the Council of Trent, lists as mortal sins or moral practices certain specific kinds of behavior which the willful acceptance of which prevents belief from sharing. Inherent promised them. In fact, body and soul are inseparable. In the person, the willing agent, the liberal act, they stand or fall together. All right, so I can't say, well, I was trying to love, but even though I stole, she had lied. That doesn't make a difference, though, because I was trying to love. I'm a good person because I was praying, even though I did A, B, and C. It doesn't really matter. We'll see this, this thinking a lot. I'm sure you've heard people say, you know, I'm really a good person, even though. I just did these, these few bad things, but I'm really a good person. Well, that's not what the scripture says. Scripture says, change these things because these things do define them. These things, these things do. And as long as we accept them and cling to them and choose them, 
and we're separated from God. So the way back to God is to reject them and to oppose them and to go to that little room back there called the confession. At this point, number 50, the true meaning of natural law can be understood. It refers to man's proper mortal nature, the nature of the human person, the person himself, and the unity of soul and body, and the unity of the spiritual and biological inclinations of all other specific characteristics. That's the absurdity of his end. Let me pause there. <laughs> You'll see, even in the life of the church, the term human nature being referred to in two different ways. So human nature can equal nature as it is, which means fallen, sinful, broken. There's a war inside of us and concupiscence. Or it can mean intended by God. And both of these things truly describe nature. We say that God became man, he got a human nature. We don't need to take on this. He didn't take on the sins of the falls or weaknesses of the flesh. We took on everything to create by God, created by God, the body, a soul, a freedom, emotions, open relationships. All those things are part of the nature. Our human nature is flawed. And so it is part of our human nature to struggle with sin. To be tempted to do the wrong thing, to desire evil. Hopefully, we don't all choose that. There's part of us that find it attractive. That's why it's a temptation. I just from the outside to the inside. There's a part of our flesh that finds it tempting and attractive to go punch Bob in the nose and jerk to me. Um, that's the fall of it. Christ's nature, though, what nature is supposed to be greater and will be in heaven, is not fall. It's still truly human beings, still real. And so, in talking about human nature, John II is saying, talk about natural law, this guidance by God of what it is human being. It's this sort of human, the part of ourselves God created. Because there is, as Paul says, another law in my members. You know, where I get angry easily, I get, I get tired easily, I don't always want to do it, what God can't help me to do. But in what God has created and given me, not what I've added and broken and messed up, but God has created and given me, that there is a guidance there in the heart of mankind, a desire for God, a desire for truth and for what's good. But what we've broken and messed up, there's also a desire for what's bad and what's easy and what's, you know, fill the blank. The natural moral law, the nature of this sense, second sense, expresses and lays down the purposes, rights, and duties which are based upon the bodily and spiritual nature of the human person. Therefore, this, this law, this natural law, can all be thought of simply as a set of norms on the biological level. Rather, it must be defined as a, the rational order where a man is called by the creator to direct and regulate his life and actions. In particular, make use of his own body. When we think of law, we often think of a set of rules. Do this, don't do this, drive the speed limit, use your blinker, return. Natural law is not a list of rules that give to us by God saying, act this way. What it is, is it is the ordering in our heart by which we know certain things are good, certain things are bad, and directing and guiding ourselves, our body, our soul toward heaven and eternal life. It's not a list of rules. It is a direction and a an ordering in our own being. Um, a part of the very essence of the human being ordering us back to what's good for us. The law of gravity is a list of rules that the rocks fall. <laughs> and they do about the answer they want. 
It's, it's just part of what it means to be rock, what it means to be material. The law of human nature is not these list of rules, but it's, it's an ordering that, that God gives on our own very being, bringing us back to himself. The difference is we are free, we can go against what is rational, what is best for us. So I can know it's not good for me to have a gallon of ice over dinner every day, but I can choose to have it anyway. Even though it's going to make me feel sick, it's going to make me fat, it's going to make me not function well, but I can still choose to do so. But by my very nature, I know it's not good for me. It's not, it's not a list of rules. It is an ordering toward heaven and not to be stuck in the life of the earth. So you have an example, John Paul II continues. The origin foundation of the duty of absolute respect for human life are you found the dignity of property of the person, not simply the natural inclination to preserve one's own physical life. Human life, even though it is a fundamental good of man, Thus acquires our moral significance in reference to the person. It must always be affirmed for his own sake. While there's always morally illicit to kill an innocent human life being, it can be illicit, praiseworthy, or even a command to give one's own life out of love for one's neighbor or, or the truth. Only in reference to the human person is his unified totality, is as a soul which expresses itself in a body and a body informed by a mortal spirit. And the human meaning of the body be grasped. Indeed, natural inclinations have moral relevance only insofar as they refer to the human person and any fulfillment. Fulfillment for which that matter can take place always only in the human nature. By rejecting all manipulations of corporality, which alters human meaning, the church serves man chosen the path of true love, the only path where he can find, where he can find the true God. The natural law thus understood does not allow for any division between freedom and nature. Indeed, these two realities are harmoniously bound together, each intimately linked to the other. Okay. So going back to those human those goods that are attached to the human person, one of those is, is your life. You know, it's not you, but it certainly is something very precious to you. And he addresses the example he was addressing. Uh, certain theories of, of why murder is wrong. You'll see, you'll see this a lot of modern day um, atheists or uh, socialists, socialists, um, sociologists, excuse me. It didn't mean socialists, that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> modern day sociologists and trying to explain why we know it's wrong to kill someone. And what they'll say is, well, we, well, we ourselves want our own life preserved, and so we just kind of Empathize other people who would preserve their life too. John II says, No, it's not why. He says, What makes the reason why it's wrong to kill people is because each human person has dignity. Each human person has a value given to them by God, which I must live up to and affirm, period. It's not simply me saying, Well, I want this, and therefore I'm going to kind of reason you do too. It's there is something fundamentally beyond that beyond me. And so my inclinations, my desires, what I'm choosing only takes on relevance when we look at the whole person and the whole picture. Why was I made? Where am I going? What am I here for? What's the reason I exist? And therefore then, this reason I exist, what I'm made for, that's what leads me to know what's good for me or bad. If I'm not living in a way that's going to bring me toward the toward, toward, toward reason I exist, for heaven or God, it's a bad thing. And we answer with this fact that is that freedom and nature can't be separate. Because part of my nature means to be free. And my freedom must be exercised in my nature. So they're distinct, but they're not separate. And so the authentic way to look at freedom and nature is as these two separate wild and separate things that, that they do with each other, but they're intrinsically linked to each other, exercising each other, 
and necessary for each other to be truly human and truly beautiful. Questions? Okay. Matthew 19, 8. From the beginning it was not so. Article 51. The alleged conflict between freedom and nature also has repercussions in the interpretation of certain specific aspects of the natural law, especially universality and immutability. If you think freedom and nature aren't, aren't united to each other, but simply freedom is relevant to being a human being, becoming body and the soul, you're going to question and wonder, do, do these things, right and wrong, apply everywhere and always, or can they change? Circumstance, time, place. So maybe it was wrong for the ancient Greeks to murder people, but for me it's not. Maybe it was wrong for them to kill their children, that, but that's your opinion, but my truth is... Didn't we just have the writings that just came out in the last few days that's going completely against this? Uh, so completely. Several few things. I mean, I mean, the whole question of abortion. Yeah. You know, the whole question of contraception. All, all these things are tied back into this. And the problem is, is you have people even in the church teaching, teaching officially, well... Right and wrong can change. We used to think this, now we know this. Our culture is different. Since we have divine will, we don't. But right. then it's fine and dandy to do all these other things because we have a divine nature. Yeah. Which again, put that, put that into one syllable words. I can do what I want. Right. And because I want it, it's good. That's the one syllable, I mean, again, the fancy term is, you know, we're all stardust, we're all made stars, we're all, you know, you share in the divine, the God in me bows to the God in you, and that time you don't even talk about it at that point, you're kind of nodding, okay, whatever you say. But what this you're saying it comes down to is, I can do what I want. Yeah. I also heard that today, too, when we were, they were talking about voting in individual states, voting on abortion and everything, and everybody will vote, and we'll all do it. Fit in our own sight. Didn't we hear that all through the Old Testament? And they did whatever they felt was right in their own hearts. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing we're so much smarter than those dumb people in the old days, right? Uh, yep. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, that's the. Yeah. <laughs> Where are these rules written? Augustine wondered. Except in the book of light, which is called truth. So natural law is part of truth. From this, every law, just law, is transcribed and has heard the heart of man and works justice. Not by wandering, but by being, as it were, impressed upon it. The image from the ring passed over to the wax does not leave the ring. You know, if you're doing a seal on a document, you push your image onto there, and it leaves that image on the wax. Um, but the, wax, the image still stays on the ring, too. <laughs> um, and so what he's saying is that every true law comes from the truth, and that's how we, and that if a, if a law is not beginning in truth and then taking the shape of truth, truth doesn't disappear, it's not the end of truth, but that the laws we, we, we give have to take from that truth. That's where we are following natural and right, permanent, unchanging, for all, always and always. Precisely because it's true, natural law involves universality. It applies to every people, everywhere, no matter who. And as much as it is inscribed in the nature of the person, it's part of how God made us, makes itself felt as all beings endowed with reason and living in history. Every human being. In order to reflect himself in a specific order, and by our free choices, by our actions, we begin to become holy or less holy, the person must do good and avoid evil, be concerned with the transmission and preservation of life, refine about the rich the material world, cultivate the social life, seek truth, practice good, and contemplate beauty. If you don't, not a good person. <laughs> The separation was somewhat positive between the freedom of individuals and the nature of which all have in common. 
as the burdens of certain philosophical theories are highly influential in present day culture. This is your truth, that's my truth. This is you know, who I am, that's who you are. I'm going to be authentic to myself, so I'm going to do what I want. Obscures the perception of the universality of the moral law on the part of reason. Inasmuch as the natural law expresses the dignity of the human person and lays the foundation for his fundamental rights and duties, what I'm called to do, what I'm, I'm obliged to do, is universal as precepts and his authority extends to all mankind. However, this universality does not ignore the individual, individuality of the human person, nor is it opposed to the absolute uniqueness of each person. On the contrary, it embraces at the root each of the person's free acts, which are meant to witness the universality of the true good. By submitting to the common law, our acts build up the true communion of persons the man by God's grace practice charity, Rounds everything together in perfect harmony. And on the contrary, they disregard the law, or even I'm really ignorant of it, but culpably or not, I react to damage the being of persons, detriment of each. What John Paul II is saying there is that the universality of the law, the fact that it always applies everywhere, doesn't damage the fact that we're individuals. In fact, it supports it. And what it means is that my acts, my choices, what I do, having a guideline, a guidance leading me back toward heaven, affects all of reality. And so my actions, my choices, what I, what I do or don't do, will change. The fact that you have children, from well, eternity, life and world are strange. The good I do, the bad I do, everything I do affects everybody's human being. And so my individual choices, my individual acts, my individual things that I do, me, affect and help everybody else, or can harm them. Um, and this happens when it, it's done by malice or by ignorance, even if called, or not, even if not called. A couple of terms there. Look at it. <laughs> Got it. Have you heard these terms before? Mm -hmm. And what is the difference? You can give an example. Well, if you're culpable, um... That means you're responsible. Okay. Right? Yes. You're okay. <laughs> and your ignorance is just mad. It does. Yeah. It's, it's like the. You're plugging your fingers in your ears. You chose to be. You're not really ignorant. You're just not attacking, basically. So, so will it be an example? Of, so, and so whether whether you truly don't know if you're or not, if someone was told, for instance, uh, not more child than human being. Some people, this is their fault for being ignorant of that fact. They refuse to look, they refuse to acknowledge it, they don't, they don't care, they don't care, they just put their fingers in their ears. Some people, it's not that they're just taught wrongly and they really trust people they've taught. It's not their fault. But either way, what happens is a baby dies. Evil happens even if somebody's ignorant, even if it's not their fault. Ignorance of the law. Your ignorance of the law is you're, you're still guilty, even though you're ignorant. Well, in this case, they're not guilty. This case, they are. This case, they're not. In this case, they wouldn't have done it, uh, but, they, but they truly believe it's not a child. There are some people, it's hard to believe, but there are some people who truly believe that, and truly it's not their fault. Not very many, but there are. Um, for a lot more in this category. And so there's people who know and don't care. There are people who uh, have chosen not to know, and therefore they're, they, they, they're, they really do know, but they've chosen not to. They're plugging their ears. The people who don't know. These people are guilty. They've said If you know and didn't act, or you, or you have chosen not to know and act anyways, if I say, I'm going to preach upon the conversation, I'm not going to live this song. I'm going to walk out. 
and use the register to power on and then come back in. Well, I thought my father didn't know. No, you're, you're totally ignorant. Mm -hmm. so you chose to be So you're officially guilty. These people have sinned. This person hasn't sinned. However, any of these three cases, a really evil is done. This person is not guilty for that, but evil still happens. These people are guilty for the evil, the judge for that evil, but the evil happens out of the case. When John Paul II is saying that their actions matter, and they damage each other and harm each other, even if it's not our fault, even if we're not guilty for it. If, if, if I drop a hammer on your head accidentally, I still kill you. So the problem happens. Now, if I'm being negligent, it's, it's more my fault. If I'm being malicious, it's even more my fault. So there's different degree and categories. Yeah. So why do we recognize this even in our, in our civil law, where we say there's first degree, second degree, third degree, manslaughter, you know, all those different camera categories. 52. It is right and just, always and for everyone, to serve God, to return worship that which is due, to honor one's parents they deserve. And what's the only way we can truly worship God in the right way, as is to do? What was that? Duty says. <laughs> Duty says. More than that, there's, particular, there's one particular, the particular act in which we give God proper worship, proper sacrifice. The Mass, yes. So positive precepts do these things, such as these, which order us to perform certain actions and cultivate certain dispositions, are universally binding. They're unchanging. Every human person must serve God, worship God, and honor their parents. They unite in, every, in the same common good to all human people at every period of history, crave for the same divine calling and destiny. These universal and permanent laws correspond to things known by practical reason, and are applied to particular acts through the judgment of conscience. So God's given us these truths, which are everybody. I can know about them by my reason as well, right? The fact that God tells me don't steal, love your neighbor, I can, I can reason that as well. I can figure it out in my mind. Now it's hard to because of life and because of cubic sense and everything else, but I can't. And then I, I figure out how to do that in the, in the real world, in my world right now, through my conscience, through my judgment, which I say, how do I love and worship God? I'm going to go to Mass. I'm going to obey the commandments. I'm going to give something up that I want to please Him. So God reveals it. I reason can also help me know it. My judgment helps me. My conscience helps me to live it out in the real world in this particular moment, with this action, with this choice. The acting subject, the person making the choices, personally assimilates the truth contained in the law. So there's the, the truth, the universal, becomes a part of me, part of, part of how I choose. He appropriates the truth of his being, makes it his own by his acts and the corresponding virtues. The negative priests of the law are also universally valid. They oblige each and every individual, always in every circumstance. It is a matter of the prohibitions which forbid a given action always and forever. Semper pro semper, always and everywhere. Without exception, the choice of this kind of behavior is no case compatible with the goodness of the will of the acting person. There's a vocation to life of God, communion with his neighbor. They shall not kill, they shall not steal, they shall not lie, they shall not commit adultery. All those things are universally valid, not just for 500 BC or whatever. It's forbidden, it's prohibited always and everywhere to about these precepts. They oblige everyone, regardless of the cost, never to defend anyone, beginning with himself, the personal dignity common to all. On the other hand, The fact that only negative commandments are obliged always under all circumstances 
does not mean that the moral life prohibitions are more important than the obligation to do good. They have the positive commandments. The reason is this. The commandment of love of God and neighbor does not have as dynamic any higher limit. It does have a lower limit, beneath which the commandment is broken. Furthermore, what must be done in any given situation depends on the circumstances, all of which can be foreseen. On the other hand, there is a kind of behavior which can never in any situation be proper response, a response conforming to the need of the human person. And it's possible that man, as a result of coercion and other circumstances, can be hindered from doing certain good actions. We can never be stopped from not doing certain actions, especially if you're prepared to die rather than do evil. What John Paul II is saying is, is he's saying that the obligation to do certain good things can never be applied to every single situation. So you can say go to Mass, work of God, absolutely. But you have to go to Mass if you, if you have a car and hang out there. But you can't. So there's no obligation to that one. Or if you're sick in bed. But you, you are always forbidden, you can never say it's okay to blossom God. And it's not that the negatives are more important than the positive commands. It has to do with following God. There is the lower limit. Do not do this. But there is no higher limit. Because you're following infinite God. Infinite good. So for example, if I'm, if I'm going to honor my parents. That might mean in some cases that I go buy them a three million dollar house. It might not mean that in a certain number of times. But it's only going to be I'm going to love them and care for them and do my best to treat them the right way. What I do beyond that is going to depend on circumstances, upon individuals, upon. But it always has to be, you can't harm them. You have to treat them with certain respect and love. But beyond that, it's going to depend upon circumstances and individuals. We all have to honor or kind of respect them, but it looks like in individual cases might, might change. For instance, if I have parents who are drug addicts and hate me, you don't want anything to do with me, I might be able to treat them or to spend time with them or to love them in an appropriate way. I can respect them respect other conditions. So different realities of the circumstances might change the, the, the practice of it, but there are certain things that must never not be. And so these always hold, these will always never wear no matter what. While the principles are in place, the goals in place, the circumstances that have lived it out might change. Does that make sense? The church has always taught that one may never choose the kind of behavior prohibited. The moral commandments express the negative form of the Old Testaments. As we have seen, Jesus himself affirms these prohibitions will have no exceptions. So, shall not kill isn't, well, you can kill in some circumstances. Shall not kill. Shall not commit adultery. Shall not steal. If you wish to enter into life, keep these commandments. The great concern of our contemporaries for historicity or culture has led some to call into question the immutability of the national law itself. Thus, there exists the rejected norms of morality. So objective meaning applying in all times, all places, always and everywhere. Unchanging truths. Value for all people present and the future, and those of those of the past. Is it even possible, they ask, to consider as universally valid and always binding certain rational determinations established in the past? But no one of the progress humanity would make in the future. So they'll say it's because we've trained, we've grown, we know, we, know, we, know, we know more, some of these laws don't apply to us anymore. I can do what I want. It must certainly be admitted that man does exist in a particular culture. But it also must be admitted that man is not exhaustively defined with that culture. 
So even if we were a different time and place, doesn't this, you're still not changed who you are. You're still a human being. You're still you. Moreover, the very progress of cultures demonstrates there is not something in man which transcends those cultures. Right? If you were locked into your culture, you couldn't grow. The culture couldn't change, develop, or progress. If all you were was that culture, the culture would, be, would stay the same. The fact that there's something bigger and beyond that lets it grow, hopefully, toward God. It lets it change and grow. If all you were is the culture entirely, if you were defined by that culture, the culture wouldn't change or grow or develop. This something is human nature. Nature is the measure of culture and the condition ensuring that man does not become the prisoner of his cultures. This asserts his personal dignity by living in accordance with the found truth of his being. To call into question the permanent structural elements of man, his body and soul, living for heaven, called for Baba God, connected to his own bodily dimension, not only would it conflict with common experience, but would render Christ's reference to the beginning precisely, render it meaningless. Christ's reference to the beginning, beginning. Precisely with the social and cultural context of time and story, the eternal meaning of the role of certain moral norms. In other words, when Christ says from the beginning it was not so, what he's saying is God established it always never. If, 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 if Christ were to say, we've changed now, now you know better. When Christ says this is what it was in the beginning, what he's saying is my father established this. With not to change. And when he's saying, you've been taught this, but from the beginning it was this, what he's saying is, you need to correct it, go back, my father said, and may. This is the reason why the church affirms underlying so many changes. There are some things that should not change. They're ultimately founded upon Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ is the beginning. Having taken on human nature, definitively illumines it in its constitutive elements. As the animism of charity before God and neighbor. Christ, the true God, the true man, shows us how to live as human beings. As to do so because he is the, the founder of human nature and the goal of human nature. Certainly, there is a need to seek out and to discover the most adequate formulation of universal and permanent moral norms. In light of contexts and cultures. In other words, the best way to say it for today, maybe what makes sense for people today... But not always work people yesterday, or vice versa. We, we speak different languages than they spoke 500 years ago. And to speak the exact same language and words would not be as helpful to speak in English. Certain analogies, expressions that might not be helpful today that were helpful 500 years ago. So the best way to say things, yes, that might change. But what's said doesn't change. What's true doesn't change. This is... Um, Formulation most capable of ceaselessly expressing their irrelevance, making them understood and authentically interpreting the truth. The truth of the moral law, if that is a positive faith, unfolds down to the centuries. These norms expressing that truth, those words that say what's right and wrong, remain valid in their substance. They must be determined and specified, must be explained in the same sense and with the same meaning. So, whatever word is said to say, don't kill, don't steal, love God, different questions is fine, as long as it means the same thing and then the same way. I might use different analogies, different expressions, different ways to teach it, different methods to teach, it has to be the same stuff. In light of historical circumstances, the church's magisterium, whose decision is preceded and accompanied by the work of interpretation, Formulation characteristic of the reason of individual behaviors and through the theological reflection. So the church helps us determine, understand, and interpret these different things that happen in our cultures, help us understand, again, always in the same way, but with the same meaning, in the same sense, in the same meaning. That's the job of the church to help us to apply it the right way. Good questions? Let's close the prayer there. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this conversation, for this time. Help us to understand more deeply the moral law. 
Help us to live it out in our lives. We may serve you here on earth and reign with you forever in heaven. We all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.